special powers and special ability. And that they will be of the 144,000 people that will be judges against the rest of mankind. If you remember one of the doctrines of the Jehovah's Witnesses, that only 144,000 people are going to go to heaven. But then when their numbers grew to more than 144,000, they had a problem. And so they rewrote the text and rewrote the scriptures to say that only those 144,000 people are allowed to take communion. So I can assure there's been more than 144,000 people since this new doctrine was written that have taken part in the communion. So like we say, a lot of these churches, they like to rewrite it as they go along. They write the script as they go along. But no matter what we want to say, we find that these crackers and these little nip bits or whatever they're chips or whatever different ones have different. I've even been to a church where they give out crisps or chips, crisps, you know, the deep fried ones instead of bread. So they even moved away from bread and it's now become potatoes. So this is not permissible. So where do we get this idea from that people can just change the text whenever they feel like it? So we find that there is often in many of these churches no remembrance of the communion service anyway, even though Jesus himself said, do this in remembrance of me. So we find that many churches have decided not to do this. Now, the reference that we find that is mentioned here, do this in remembrance of me, is when Jesus is having his last meal with his disciples. May Allah be pleased with him. And it's a Thursday evening, Thursday night, where he gathered them all together. You can find this in Luke chapter 22 and verses 17 onwards. And so that night is the beginning of the Jewish Passover. And it was part of the Jewish Passover that eat bitter herbs, they'd eat bread, and they'd bring wine. Sometimes you'll see documentaries or so-and-so with the Passover, with the Jewish Passover, and they have bitter herbs, have unleavened bread, flat bread without yeast or anything in it, and they'll have wine or whatever, light the candles. It's a very, very important part of the Jewish calendar. In fact, there's nowhere that the Christian is told to stop celebrating the Passover. Nowhere does it say, well, now that Jesus has come, that the Passover must stop. So those Christians who choose to stop celebrating the Passover are again not following the biblical narrative. The Passover was something that the prophet Jesus was teaching the people to do. In fact, he says, don't stop the Passover celebration, even though I go. So this is why he says to them, do this in remembrance of me. So when you celebrate the Passover, think of what the relevance of the Passover is, but remember also me when you celebrate the Passover. So why do Christians celebrate the Passover every Sunday? So our Passover is only once a year. Well, why do the Catholics celebrate the Passover three times a day when it was only once a year? Or why do the Jehovah Witnesses give an interpretation that only the person who eats the bread and drinks that wine is going to be one of the 44,000 where hundreds of thousands of Jews all over the world celebrate Passover every year? So the understanding again is because they didn't understand the culture, they don't understand the text, they don't understand how it was written, what was being said. They've read into the text instead of what the text is actually saying. So the whole idea of communion is a misunderstanding of what the text in fact says. Jesus himself is saying, well, I'll be pleased with him, he's saying, celebrate the Passover. Do not stop the Passover. So the Passover is celebrating a period of time in Jewish history where the people were set free from captivity. They were allowed to be free. Because the Jewish history is full of captivity. They were free, then they were captive again. Then they were free, and then they were captive again. So this is celebrating the event, which there's very little historical record for, by the way. But that is an issue for another topic. But whatever it celebrates, it is Passover. So Jesus is reminding them in the Christian text, the prophet Esau, peace be upon him, is reminding them, keep this custom going. Don't change this custom. Keep it going. And every time you do it, remember me. So he breaks the bread, he gives them the wine, and he tells them, remember what I am doing on this day, celebrating this Passover with you. He's not replacing it. He's not terminating it. Remember what he said before? Not a dot, not a tittle, not a mark, not a line not an exclamation mark, will change on that letter. Until heaven and earth pass away, have heaven and earth passed away, heaven and earth have not passed away. Therefore, keep the Passover going. That's what he's telling them. 
Christians who read this and have an other understanding of this are incorrect. He never said, now use grape juice from now on. He never said, now use crackers from now on. He said, do it in exactly the same way. So if we believe the narrative of the New Testament, which we don't, but if we had to believe this part of the narrative, we find that it is something that Christians are not actually doing themselves. Why do we not follow this as Muslims? Why don't we follow this narrative? Does anybody, we might be sitting here and say, but why don't we follow this? I mean, surely this is, if it was the Passover, sure we should follow it. Anybody have any idea why we don't follow this? Or shall I just tell you, for charge of misery? We don't do it because it is of very doubtful nature. When we look at the historical record, and we look at what happened in that time that they were supposed to have been in captivity and then freed from Egypt and all the story that is given, it is very, very different to what we find in Islam, the narrative. It's a different story. And so we find it difficult when we have a mythological story, which is more the biblical one, compared to the one that actually makes sense. We don't follow that text. We don't follow the Christian text. The text that is written in the New Testament, it talks against itself. It defiles itself. It dirties itself. So if we find that the texts all agreed with each other, then we could say, hey, this is likely that it happened. But it's not possible. Not when there is so much doubtful nature in it. And we can barely get through a line in the New Testament. I'm busy writing a book at the moment where it goes through the New Testament, chapter and verse, like chapter 1, verse 1. And you know, I've written hundreds of pages and I haven't even got through the first book of the New Testament because literally there are mistakes. Some verses have like eight or nine mistakes just in one verse. So think of like maybe 10 words. They are, almost every word is a mistake. That's how bad it is. And I never realized it was going to be such a great undertaking. I thought it would be easy to do. So this is why we have problems. Uh, we have problems with the language. We have problems with the way the expressions of the day that don't fit that time period. We have problems with inaccuracies of descriptions of things that they saw or said they saw. They could never have happened at that time. So there are many, many errors that we are discovering as we're going through it that we just cannot accept. So this is why we as Muslims, we cannot accept just on the say-so of a book that has no chain, no chain that we can check to see that this is actually true. Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, its introduction just says, according to. It doesn't say these are the words of Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. It says according to. And we know from Christian theologians, even the Bible school guy, who we say you shouldn't listen to, will have to acknowledge, will have to admit, none of these books were written by those people. So there's no chain of command. There's no link that we can follow to say this is reputable or reliable. It's time for us to take a break. When we get back from the break, we'll continue, inshallah. <laughs> solution for humanity. If I were to ask you about the life of our beloved Prophet wasallam, about the incidents that occurred before his prophethood and in Mecca and in Medina, about the names of his loved ones and his wives and his children, how much would we be able to know? How many incidents have we memorized? Brothers and sisters, isn't it more important that we study the seerah of the most important human being who ever walked the face of this earth? Join me, your host Yasser Qadhi, as we discuss the most important biography of the most illustrious human being that ever lived, the seerah of our beloved Rasul Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Join Yasser Qadhi in Seerah of the Prophet, peace be upon him 
every Monday at 4.30 p.m. and repeat telecast at 2 a.m. UK on Peace TV. Dialogue. Dialogue. Discussion, 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 debate, 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 rebuttal, rebuttal, rebuttal conclusion, conclusion. Eliminate misconceptions about religion. Get enlightened. Witness Dr. Zakir Naik in a battle of words in Crossfire every Saturday at 8.30 p.m. and repeat telecast at 10 a.m. UK on Peace TV. <laughs> Iman is the secret of Allah in His creation, that which He places into the hearts of those that He loves. He loves. He loves. He loves. He loves. Once it glows, nothing is stronger that can drive a person, and nothing is sweeter that a person can experience. It's a glimpse of paradise that you see with the eyes of your heart. Unlock your Iman with my new series, Imanology, The Fundamentals of Faith. Enrich your Iman by following the factors that would open the door of eternal blessings for all believers in Imanology, the study of Iman. Next on Peace TV. Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Assalamu alaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Welcome back. We're continuing with our series as we look into the story of the communion that Christians celebrate. And we said that Jesus speaking to the people says, do this in memory of me, and yet the Christians have interpreted this in their own particular and peculiar way. To mean that you should do this every week, to mean that you should do this two or three times a day, whether you should do this once a year, whether they place it outside of Passover, whatever they want to interpret it, most of them, if not all of them, have interpreted it wrong because they are not listening to what it's said. You're not supposed to do it every week. You're not supposed to do it every day. It's a once a year event at the Jewish Passover. Not when you decide when the 144,000 are going to be chosen, as the Jehovah's Witnesses have decided. So your priest, your pastor is teaching you incorrectly. This is a doctrine that was created as a way to control the people. By saying to the people, if you, you know, come to confession, come to confession. If you come to confession, then you can only have communion. Where it's a, a once a year event. So your church is teaching you the wrong doctrine, giving you the wrong information. And the very fact that the symbols that are being presented on the table when you take part in the Eucharist or communion are not the symbols that are required anyway. There needs to be wine, there needs to be bread, and it was unleavened bread. So it wasn't bread that was raised that any yeast in it. You have to follow the customs and the traditions of the day. And in fact, you should have actually had some bitter herbs as well with it. We don't see these things happening. But what we do know from the narrative is that Jesus never mentions, according to the narrative of the New Testament, anything about the bitter herbs. He only mentions the two things, the bread and the wine. And we know that these are literally his blood and literally his body. You cannot interpret these to say, no, they're not literally. He specifically said, this is blood indeed, and this is flesh indeed. So you can't change that text to suit yourself. So many of the religions in the world, like the Lutheran, the Greek Orthodox, the Catholics, and the Anglican Church, they believe that it is the literal body and the literal blood. Outside of that, of the other 30,000 denominations, they don't believe that. So if you're a Catholic, you can take some credit and you can say, well, at least we believe it's a literal blood and literal flesh. But the problem is you've got the wrong symbol. Even though you might have wine, you've got the wine mixed with vinegar. There's nothing that says you must mix the wine with vinegar. Catholics will take wine and they'll mix it with vinegar. Who told you to add vinegar? So you're innovating. They'll take a host and lift up the host, a little wafer. And they say, this is the body. Who told you to make a wafer? 
It's supposed to be bred. You can't change the text. You can claim and say, well, it's got no yeast in it. It's still not bred. It's a wafer made in a factory, pressed millions of them, and sent all over the world to different Catholic churches. So we need to make sure that we are going to be following the text if you're a Christian, and then you need to stay within the confines of what you are supposed to be doing. So how many people are doing this in remembrance of me, as Jesus said? None. Not the Catholics, not the Greek Orthodox, not the Lutherans, not the Anglicans, nobody, because they all have changed it in one way or the other, or have given it a new interpretation of what Jesus, peace be upon him, was actually saying at that time. There is no Superman information entailed in what he is saying there. He is just saying, remember the Passover. He's not talking about anything supernatural. The interpretation has been given by first coming up with a doctrine and then trying to superimpose over the event of the Passover meal or the Last Supper as it's been classified. So the idea is given there. Let's look at the first letter of Corinthians where it talks about the Lord's Supper as it's become known in the Christian community. It says, just going to look at verse 24. It says, this is my body which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. He's not saying, you know, that you must now stop doing the Passover and replace this with mine. He's saying, do this. This is my body. Do this in remembrance of me. He's saying people to remember this act, to keep this tradition going, to keep this custom going. And he says, this is the cup of the new covenant in my blood. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. How often is it? Some people will say, well, he says this, do this whenever you drink. Well, that means that every single time you drink anything, you'd have to do the ceremony. That's what he's saying. Can't take the literal translation of this and say, well, because that line says, do this often when you drink it, he's not saying that now you must do this every Sunday or every day. Otherwise, you could say every single time you pick up a cup, you're going to have to do this. So this is not the understanding. This is not the way that you can understand this verse. It's not an acceptable interpretation that some Christians have done. And they say, because the word used says, do this often. He's saying do this on every occasion. Often can be if you live 100 years, that'll be often. Okay, so this is the only way we can possibly understand that. Let's move on to the next doctrine, the next issue that we are going to be dealing with. And Christians often criticize Catholics and say to Catholics, Orthodox, you know, you people respect Mary way too much. Miriam, may Allah be pleased with her. They say, you know what, you give her too much credit. You've made her into a form of worship where you worship Mary more than you do Jesus. This is the accusation that many Protestants make against Catholicism. And the Catholics make the insinuation to the Protestants, you don't respect her enough. So we find that within Christianity today, we have the one extreme or the other. In Islam, we have a healthy respect for the mother of Jesus. May Allah be pleased with her and him. Both of them are very important. In fact, we know that she was a chaste woman, that she was a special woman, that she was a scholarly woman. She wasn't just some you know, unknowner, didn't know anything. She was very intelligent. We know she was a smart woman. And that's why Allah chose her. So we look at the narrative that we find in Luke chapter 1, verse 38, where it speaks about her being the handmaiden of the Lord. Now, we do not agree with what's going to be spoken about in this episode, in this final part of this episode. We do not agree with this. Let's put this out there right in the beginning. Let's make that understood right from the very beginning. But from the Christian narrative, if you reject Mary and you want nothing to do with Mary, may Allah be pleased with her, if you want to reject her, or if you want to go to the other side, you are both in danger because the text does not give you permission to do this. It definitely does not give you permission to reject her. It says in Luke chapter 1, verse 48, All nations shall call Mary blessed. So if you reject her, you're going against what it says in Luke chapter 1, verse 48. And Elizabeth, who is the mother of John the Baptist, says that she was filled with the Holy Spirit. According to Christians, the Holy Spirit only came when Jesus, peace be upon him, left. But in this narrative, we see that she was filled with the Holy Spirit. And it says in Luke chapter 1, verse 42, Blessed are you amongst women, and blessed is the fruit of your womb. So very clearly, 
we see a hell to quite a high status in the biblical narrative. Yet most Christians try to say that she was just an ordinary Jewess, no one important. But the text makes her something very important if you're going to follow what the New Testament text is saying. And so we see that the Virgin Mary is blessed, as the Bible says, that the Holy Scriptures that Christians follow according to them, Holy Scripture. So in Luke chapter 1, she is spoken about as being the mother of God. Allah, but this is what the text says. So when we look at this, we have to ask ourselves, why do people amongst Catholic communities not even give any respect to Mary at all? She's just nothing. They just go right past her. And then we have the Catholics that have called her the mother of God, gone overboard. They called her the mother of God. Can you believe that people would even say such a, a silly thing? But people say this. But if you are going to accept that Mary, according to the biblical narrative, what it says in the Bible, you have to accept what the Bible says if you're a Bible believer. And the Bible-believing, fearing people have to accept that she was blessed, that she was the mother of God according to the text. Whether you like it or you don't like it, you can't choose to follow it or not follow it. You have to follow it. And by the fact that you are going to allow those verses to remain means that you now have no longer a trinity, but you have a quiddity. You have four persons. Actually, quiddity doesn't mean four. It means uh, some intelligent, try someone being sarcastic. It's an English word, but I'm just using it in this sense because I can't think of maybe a quiddity. I don't know. You don't believe in the trinity, you believe in the quiddity because you'd have God the Mother, God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit. That makes four. In fact, there are hundreds of people part of the Trinity if you actually start counting. Because many people are called sons of God and daughters of God, and Jerusalem is called the Son of God. Lots and lots and lots and lots and lots of people are added into the Trinity if you actually start counting. But for today's sake of our argument here, and the doctrine that has been created by the Catholic Church, claiming that Mary is the mother of God, and the doctrine of the rest of Christianity that says Mary is nothing, then the problem is that the text claims her to be blessed, special, Holy Spirit full, the mother of God. You have a problem. Your priests who say that she's not important, they're going to have to explain these verses to you. And those ones who claim that she's the mother of God, then you have to add her into the Trinity. You can't leave her out. And it's very interesting that when you actually read the text, when you at home go and read the story of the crucifixion scene, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, whichever version you decide to read at home. What happened to these women? Did you know that Mary, the mother of Jesus, was not at the crucifixion scene? Just because an artist painted her at the crucifixion scene when Jesus was supposed to have died according to your text doesn't mean she was there. Did you know that? You believed it? Your pastor told you she was there. Everybody's been drawing paintings and pictures of her being there. She wasn't there. Go read the text again. Next week when we get back together again, or next time we come together, maybe we'll deal with that, inshallah. But she's not there. There are other Marys. And this gives us a whole question. Why are there so many Marys? Couldn't they give them other names? It's done like this on purpose to keep you confused. Make sure you join us again, same place, same time. So from me, Arib Islam, Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh.